Thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is a session on Next Generation of Real Food Campaign. My name is Lisa Stokey, and my organization, Next Seven, is a partner in Real Food Campaign. Um, how many of you have heard of the Real Food Campaign? Do you know what it is? Beautiful, thank you. Um, so I just want to um, introduce um, our panel really quickly. This is Dan Kittredge. You guys probably don't know who Dan is, but He's the founder and executive director of Fire and Dream Food Association. Many of you may not know that he started the Real Food Campaign before he started BFA. So, um, Real Food Campaign has lived in heaven? Okay. And um, to my right here, this is Jonas Hunter. And he is working closely with us on Real Food Campaign and helping us to do a lot of really important uh, management and operational and strategic and vision, vision tasks within uh, citizen science that Next7 is launching and also the overall Real Food Campaign. And this is Lydia Stokey, and she is helping us to you know, do program management uh, for Real Science, um, which is the outreach which will explain more what citizen science is. Um, we live in Colorado, Lydia is my daughter, and she has been spending a lot of good time um, gathering samples there in Boulder County, and. Um, talking with the lab and so forth, so she's going to share about some of her experiences with that. And we just, I just want to say, we want to make this like to be a really interactive and, and fun panel. We want to hear from you too. So we're going to spend a little time sharing with you, giving you some updates. Probably people want to have some updates, and then we're going to open it up and we just want to be able to have a good conversation. So to take it away, Dan. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just I saw almost everyone raised their hands when they. Uh, she asked what the real food campaign was, but I think it's probably worth just reviewing a background historically what we're endeavoring to accomplish and where we're at, and then that should give some perspective to this next phase. You know, broadly, I think people are familiar with the concept of we're trying to effectively build a spectrometer that a consumer can use at the grocery store to figure out relatively how good food is, or a farmer's market, or wherever. And there's a bunch of steps involved in doing that. You know, the obvious step is to build the spectrometer itself, the first generation of which we built a couple of years ago in 2017 and released here. And that's sort of, that's the, that's the physical thing. The uh, background component which is necessary, which has not occurred yet, is to define what quality is. We as animals can discern flavor variation in a tomato or a peach with our tongues or our noses and have some pretty good insight into that, but as far as a piece of hardware, you know, an algorithm, a set of data that's used to define this is in the 80th percentile, this is in the 20th percentile, that functionally has not occurred. There is no um, empirical definition of the variation of nutrient levels in food as of yet. And so in 2018, we built a lab in Michigan to begin that process and we worked with just two crops, uh, carrots and spinach, and ran almost a thousand samples of those two crops through the lab and identified variations in nutrient levels. If, depending on what, which elements and compounds you were looking at, if it was an element like a copper or zinc or calcium or potassium or sulfur or molybdenum, um, the variation we found was between 400 and 1800 percent, which means basically this carrot has as much copper in it as those four carrots, or this leaf of spinach has in it as much iron in it as those 18 leaves of spinach, which is a quite profound variation, much larger than I think is oftentimes considered to be the variation in food out there. An interesting aspect of what we found was that the, there was no correlation between organic and conventional. There was no correlation between store-bought and, and sort of farmer's market. So that meant there were some quote-unquote conventional carrots in the grocery store that were more nutritious than organic carrots in the grocery store and that were actually more nutritious than organic carrots from the farmer's market, etc. So there was no, by label or point, of, or point of purchase, there was no ability to predict nutritional value, which we hypothesize would be the case because our understanding is that it's how the crops are produced that matters not the label that they're marketed under. And so, again, 2018, we built the lab when we assessed those two crops. 
in 2018, we broadened the scope of the number of crops we sampled to include lettuce, spinach, cherry tomatoes, and grapes. We're still in the process of sampling crops this year. We will probably continue through the end of the year. And if people actually do want to engage with us in this citizen science this year, there is an opportunity there to do that. So we can perhaps get back to that later. Um, I think primarily this conversation is focused towards next year and more systemic data collection. So I said we predicted that there was a correlation between how the crop was produced and its nutrient levels. And so this year, in 2019, we built out the capacity for farmers to input information about how the crops were produced. So soil type, fertility program, management practice, cultivars, climate data, that sort of thing. And then send in the soil and the crop to the lab. And so we can begin to correlate environmental conditions with nutrient levels. And that's a process that's ongoing. Uh, Greg, who's over here in the corner, and Dan, who run the lab, spoke with, I believe it was Dorn this morning, um, on some of the results that came this, you know, from this year's work uh, that we're still looking at. So one of the struggles we've had is one of capacity and the logistics of doing all this work, raising the money, running the lab, digesting the samples, building the codes, et cetera, et cetera, um, is quite significant. And we have not, I would say, done a very good job of reaching out to the, the people, our, our partners, farmers, other organizations, to sort of more actively engage in this data collection process. And that's what Next7 is stepping in to um, actively support as a, you know, in this project in the coming year. And so that's really the, the frame, I think, of the conversation today is engaging people, whether they're consumers or growers or organizations, in actively doing the data collection, sending in the samples, and broadening the base of, of knowledge. We have a, you know, I personally, at least, have a fairly ambitious goal of taking the tool that we have now and re-engineering it and building sufficiently large data sets to have a a real slick, mass-produced, consumer-calibrated unit that can really hit the, the market broadly in two years. And so for that to be accomplished, one of the things that has to occur is a much greater engagement on the ground with people in this process. We don't know what the variation of, in nutrient levels in crops is until we can get samples in from all over the place, different parts of the country, different varieties, different management practices, different soil types. We can't correlate that with management until we get growers to share that information. So that's the sort of the broad frame of, of where we're at. I'm not sure if it would be appropriate to take a couple of questions now uh, to see if people have comprehended that before we move on to the next logistical stages. Um, you took the data on the nutrients of the device. Was there any kind of like um, uh, comparison of a taste test of, of people actually confirming that yes, this was a higher nutrients did in fact taste better? Um, there has been some work to c taste crops while they're sampled and Greg can confirm, I don't think all of the crops have been done that way but some subset have been. Just to be clear, we're not doing the nutritional assessments of the crops with the spectrometer. There's a, probably a really important point here that needs to be understood that the spectrometer that we're using right now is not testing nutrient levels. What, so what is a spectrometer and how does it work? Maybe we can just step back to that basic level. I like to use the example of Alpha Centauri um, to explain this point. People may have heard of Alpha Centauri. It's a star. It's you know six light years away or something. It's one of the closest stars to us, which is not the sun. People may have heard of the Voyager 1, Voyager 2. There were you know probes that were sent off in the 1970s um, to study different planets. And they've been going for 40 plus years and they've reached the edge of the solar system. They're actually the probes that have been sent furthest from Earth of anything that human civilization has sent out. And they're about 12 light hours away at this point. Alpha Centauri is tw six light years away. If you ask any astrophysicist what Alpha Centauri is composed of, they'll say, well, it's 51% you know, hydrogen, it's 48% helium, it's 1% other gases and these levels and ratios. They don't know what Alpha Centauri is made up of because they went there to sample it they know what Alpha Centauri is made up of because they took a picture of the light that came from it. Copper is an element in chemistry, but it's a vibration in physics. It vibrates at a certain frequency, which is basically a color. Zinc is a 
element in chemistry, but it's a vibration in physics. And so when the astrophysicists take a picture of the light coming off of Alpha Centauri, they can effectively see what it's composed of. And that's spectroscopy. That's how you know, spectrometers work. This tool we've got, it basically reads the light coming off of the carrot or the light coming off of the cucumber. And that's the, so they couldn't assess copper. They had to practice with burning copper, seeing what color it was, what the light was, and then calibrating the machine accordingly. Does that make sense? Sort of? So basically what we're doing with the samples in the lab is when they come in, we flash the spectrometer at them, get a reading off of them, which looks like peaks and valleys on a graph. It has no like, levels of copper, or levels of polyphenols. It doesn't say anything like that. All it says is peaks and valleys on a graph. And then you take that carrot and you run it through the lab. And you use benchtop equipment to assess mineral levels, to assess polyphenol levels, to assess carotenoid levels, etc. And so what we're doing right now is we're taking those spectral signatures, overlaying them on the mineral levels, trying to find patterns, and then telling the machine, this pattern means the 80th percentile, this pattern means the 40th percentile. Does that make sense? So we're not actually directly testing copper with the spectrometer. That's not a capacity the spectrometer has. Perhaps in future generations we will have that capacity for farmers in the field to actually assess actual nutrient levels of the leaves while the plants are growing. That's not where we're at right now and that's not what we're trying to accomplish with this consumer tool. We're trying to say this is the spectral signature of a high quality carrot, this is the spectral signature of a low quality carrot, and we're training the machine to recognize those things. And then that's the calibration that would be released. So the tool we have now hopefully will be able to tell you red, yellow, green in the grocery store or the farmer's market by next year. Yeah. So the compounds in the leaf in the skin of a peach or the skin of an orange correlate with the flesh of the peach or the flesh of an orange. You're going to have different compounds in the skin based on the health of it as well as the flesh. So we have to go through this process of taking every single crop and looking at the data and trying to figure it out. It's a scientific process. So I think this is a good time to talk about, you know, getting that data. Yes. And um, the citizen science lab, um, like in the next year or two, like we have ambitious goals for 2020. <laughs> <laughs> um, and getting samples, we have samples, we have six crops, right? This year, started, six yeah. crops, yeah. Cool. And so obviously there's a lot of lot of food out there. There's melons and apples and broccoli and all kinds of things. So uh, maybe I'll just I'll allow Jonas and Lydia to, to talk a little bit. Jonas, you want to talk a little bit about our outreach program here at Seven Citizen Science? So we're in um, we're in discovery we're in discovery phase right now. And part of what you see in the booth out there is is uh, our start of this experiment of us figuring out what you know what is the citizen science brand that we're developing, how we're going to reach out to the public audience, and um, in a very specific, you know, so the specific work that we have to do is to support support the lab. So there's samples that we have to gather. What's, the, what's our current aim right now for next year? For next year? We're still talking about it. We're still talking about it. Is it in thousands? Uh, I, I was able to do five and ten thousand samples. We want to run through the lab next year. So we need to get yeah. these samples over Greg, and it's by process terms of, and Lydia can talk more specifically about that, but um, so one aspect of the project is to collect all these samples for, for Greg's team and, uh, and Dan and to be able to cal calibrate the device. So what we're looking at is in this process, how do we engage, how do we engage the public in a conversation of nutrition? You know, the end, the end goal, you know, the mission of, of uh, the Real Food campaign what, what, what's our actual mission statement? The BFA is increasing quality in the food supply. So, so we're pretty quality, close. Increasing quality in the food supply. Yeah. And what does that mean to the average person? Um, and that's, that's where there's a conversation. So part of it is in individual conversations, and Lydia can speak to that. And another part is in us having you know, regional communities involved, involved as well. And the way this aligns with Next Sevens bigger uh, mission as well. The next seventh mission is really around how do we raise 
you know, our level of awareness in what we're eating, the way we're acting, to be able to create a world for the next set of generations that's here and beautiful. So this is one aspect of Next Seven's Next Seven's mission, and you know there will likely be other programs as well that Next Seven's involved with. But by focusing on nutrition, this is a key way that we get into everyone's lives and homes, and and create this greater this greater conversation. So um, you know we are we're really interested to hear what people what people's ideas are about how we take this campaign to the public. Um, there's this practical work of collecting samples. Again, we want to start we want to start a conversation. A little bit about my background. Um, I've done work with, um, with social businesses and nonprofits for the last 10 years. Um, I was the founding executive director for Kiss the Ground. And we one of the first things that we did was taking this story, the soil story, and putting this meme of regenerative agriculture, taking it from the people that had started it, like the Rodale Institute, and really making it a, you know, almost an industry, bring it out much more in public. So, you know, this is a discovery process right now. We're gonna you know, invite everybody here. Thank you all for showing up to be part of this uh, part of the as well. And maybe I'll share a little bit about how the actual engagement's going with the people and some yeah. of First of all, people are always so excited to hear about it. I mean, I figured the first time we approached this project, we went to the farmer's market and just started talking to people just about the project itself. And I'm so nervous as I am right now, public speaking. <laughs> but they just, they can't believe that something like this exists, that we're really like out there engaging everybody in this process. Um, What's, what's um, are there stories? Well, yeah, let me just, just, so as an example here, I mean, we've had a bit of a difficult time getting individuals to commit to sending in a certain number of samples per week. The lab, we have a lab in, in Michigan, that's our primary lab, which has the capacity to run about 200 samples per week. Um, we're just setting up a a satellite lab in Chico, uh, California. Chico State University is our first partner lab. Um, I'm not sure what their numbers are, 50, 100 maybe per week. But coordinating the logistics of the number of samples being sent in from around the country is has been part of our struggle from a very practical standpoint. We now have the hardware, the staff, the process, the protocol, the logistics to do this, but we need help getting all the stuff sent in from around the country. This is the citizen science piece, is how do we engage people. So what Lydia's been doing in Boulder um, is a new model that we started basically late this summer, early this fall, which to me feels like it's got a lot of potential. And that is, um, instead of having a, you know, a person here and a person here go to the farmer's market, go to the grocery store, go to their garden, go to farms, and have that sort of weight of uh, all the work on them, it's really to look at it at a community, at a county, at a at a at a you know a region, and say, and this is a way to engage people from a practical standpoint. There's 30 farms in your local farmers market. There's eight grocery stores in your you know in your county. Would you like to know which farm or which grocery store has the best quality food? For a lot of people, that's a much more practical thing that has more visceral relevance to them than. Here's a concept that we're working on, and there's no way you can really engage in it except send stuff in. But it's we need lots of money, and it's this grand vision, you know, bringing it down to a local area where it seems is where people are more likely to engage and say, "Can you get a few friends together, and you know, agree that you know, the third Saturday of every month, they're going to each bring their shopping from a different grocery store or a different farmers market or a different CSA bag. We're all going to get together." maybe have a bottle of wine, you know, label everything, stick it in a box, and ship it out. And so we can say to this community over here, look, in, in you know, Boulder County, we've got a full spectrum of analysis of what's going on. We can say in Marin County, we, in Westchester County, whatever areas are, 
other organizations, other partners. I'm looking at Brigida here and thinking of Weston Price. You know, we've got local chapters in Weston Price as examples. We've got NOFA chapters. We've got all these other kinds of allies and organizations that I would say would have an interest in doing this. So what are people's relationships? What are their communities? What are their thoughts, et cetera? But that's really what you know, Lydia's been doing here um, this fall in, in Boulder is sort of getting that process up off, uh, off the she road. She said organic pig. Organic pig. <laughs> <laughs> so we started off talking, as she said, with the head of the Boulder County Farmers Market, which is Denver and Boulder and Longmont, and said, here's what we're doing. And he said, great. You know, there's this idea that local food is better than grocery store food, and the farmers are struggling with competition from the, from the, from the grocery stores. So yes, we'll go we'll talk to all of our farmers and get them to submit samples, and then we we'll go to the grocery stores and just get samples from there and send them all in, and then we can have a report which says, this is where the good stuff is, this is where it's not. Yeah, so Brigitte's question was, what data do you need? Because you can't get the management data from the grocery store. And that certainly is the case, that you're not going to be able to get the full spectrum of how it was produced on every, every crop. And we don't expect that. We certainly need a subset of crops from farms directly where we can get that complete information. And we call those farm partners. And um, really, anybody who's going to engage in that level of depth is not really part of the citizen science side. I mean, we generally try to direct them directly to the lab. And, and there's a, a bunch more effort there in putting together your two-year historical management practice records and doing your weekly record, record no. keeping. But within citizen science, I would just add to that, like Lydia, she went out to the farms and she got samples of crops with the soil, like right underneath it. So she went down like, what, four inches to get samples and then four to eight inches and got a sample, did that three times. And um, I think that was what she was kind of referring to is that she was having a lot of fun engaging with the farmers. So even though, you know, it's not a, like the extent of being a farm partner, there is that level of also going out to the farms themselves and getting the soil. On a, on a, I guess on a more practical level for us today here, I mean, that is practical, of course, but um, on an engagement level, um, with citizen science, we're working to give people a process for plugging into that, right? So there's an application process. You know, the lab has been handling that. I think in 2020, we're going to be working much more closely with them on that vetting so they can do more of what they're, they're you know, really great at and we need them to do, which is like doing the sampling and the testing and the analysis. Um, so um, on next7.org backslash citizen science, you can go there and apply to be a data partner. Actually, you're going to sign up and then we will contact you because we need to have these, these leaders. I mean, really citizen science. We want people to, we need people to really take ownership of it, right? And have people with you in your community. You can, like Dan said, we have house parties, but then you can also just have people um, in your community, your friends, you know, if you're, you know, a part of any kind of group. I mean, mom's groups are really great. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a mom, I, am, I raised four kids. And their health and nutrition was really, really important to me. So if I'd had access to something like this, being able to send samples in, right, to know um, where I could find the best food, I think it's just, I mean, I think it's just, you know, it's brilliant. It's amazing. I met, I met Dan, basically, um, I have a long history in advocacy in food and agriculture uh, through another organization I co-founded, Food Democracy Now. And... Um, I had a dream that I was standing in the grocery store in the produce aisle, you know, looking for vitality in produce. Because I thought, well, that's what our kids really need. You know, they need vitality. They don't need just no chemicals or no GMOs or whatever, right? Food is like what we get, not what we don't get, right? It's what we gain from it. And also a relationship to that, a relationship to the farmers, and those are all of the things that you know, inform my decisions in feeding my kids. And so um, I had a dream that I was in a grocery store checking for vitality with a device. And I thought, this has to be possible. Someone's going to be doing something like this. And so I started asking around. And they were like, well, I think Jack Kittredge's son is doing something like that. You should check with his son. <laughs> And then I saw Dan, and lo and behold, he was working on something like that. <laughs> Talking about it, I think. <laughs> Talking about it, yeah. yeah. So, so, um, so, yeah, there's so many 
ways to plug in into this, and we, we need lots of you to do that. Question here. Thanks. I have a question about feedback loops. So, for example, I love that you found a way to find a feedback loop for participant scientists, community scientists, to find, like, which grocery store am I going to go buy my carrots? Like, that's a real practical thing. That feedback is valuable. And calibrating the device, obviously, chiefly valuable. I'm curious about the feedback loop of going to get soil samples at a farm instead of being a partner, a farmer partner. Uh, and if that is a feedback loop, so for instance, I, in my mind, I went to, oh yeah, so if Lydia and I are out there taking farm samples and sending them to the lab, and we're also drop shipping huge amounts of produce to the lab, then is the lab telling us which of our produce, which farm to go to, to take that soil test, or am I blindly taking soil tests? That's my question. Uh, the lab is telling you how to take a soil test, um, but really we haven't, you know, which farms will let you onto their, onto the farm and let you get your hands in the dirt and, and dig it up and send it off. You know, some people don't really want you assessing their stuff. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's basically metadata, the concept of overlapping layers of data. Like, you don't need to have from every carrot the whole historical management practice. Right. But if you have some subset, that'll help with the calibrations. For every carrot, you don't need to have soil, but if you have a subset that has soil, that helps with the calibrations. Okay. So, if anybody's familiar with AI and you know big data and algorithms and all these fancy sounding words that are becoming more and more prevalent in today's day and age, you rarely know everything about anything. Right. But if you know a few things about a lot of stuff, and it doesn't all have to be the same, it that you know the more pieces you know, the easier it is to pull out patterns. So. So those um, citizen gathered soil samples that are available mm -hmm. come in and they just support the general intelligence of the system. The thing that everybody usually sends in is the crop itself. Yeah. And sometimes you have the soil that the crop grew in, and sometimes you have the soil the crop grew in and the information about how it was grown. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's Thank basically you. the process. Yeah. On, on that note. Um, there's there's a couple of different things that can happen in this campaign as well. So for one, we're, we're, gathering, we're gathering this data to calibrate the device. We're getting people involved. But in the process, we're getting this valuable information back to the consumer, and we're able to aggregate it as well. So the lab data, of course, is, is, much, is, is much more vast than what we're going to get from the spectrometer. So, Part of this as well is we're, we're thinking about how do we map this data in a way that could have much wider impact on the, you know, the overall way that we're looking at food and nutrition in the marketplace. So this is another big aspect that we're looking at as well, which is that in the process of gathering all this information, there could be something powerful that we can do as well. Uh, the six crops right now are carrots, spinach, lettuce, cherry tomatoes, kale, and grapes. How many years of data do we want to take? How many do we need to take? We don't need to have the same data from the same farm multiple years. That certainly is great. The, the end game of this whole process, which may be in a couple of years, a pretty good basic standard for this is high quality, this is low quality, I hope will be evolving over time. The vision that I've got is that if we have, you know, the current status of the supply chain right now, which is that most crops are standing in the 15th percentile of what's possible, if, if we begin to make that information evident to consumers and they start to demand the stuff that's in the 50th and 60th and 70th percentile and that leaves the shelves and the stuff on the 15th percentile sits there, that there's going to be a, a, a feedback loop to growers, to buyers, etc to improve quality. And so functionally, what was in the 15th percentile now, or two years from now, may be in the fifth percentile because everybody is starting to do a better job. So the vision is that this is a continuously evolving process. It's going to be going on year after year. We, you know, the reason you get this, the <coughs> crops from a farm with the management practice data is so you can give other farmers recommendations about what works and what doesn't. 
So the reason you be collecting samples over time, year after year, is to improve the calibration of what's good and what's not. So it's a, you know, we're at this point moving forward on a year by year basis. Like what are the next obvious steps we'd like to accomplish and what can we plausibly accomplish? If I didn't make it clear ahead of time or at any point previously, this entire project is being done open source, as in everything is being done in the commons, all the information is freely available, all the engineering is freely available, all the app development is freely available, which means that there's no investment money in it, which means that it's being funded entirely by donations, which means that we can't do anything close to what we'd like to do because we don't have the cash for it. So theoretical ideals are not what we're dealing with so much as practical logistics of what's a priority to move forward. Yeah. Yeah, uh, a couple questions. Um, so you mentioned demand for mm -hmm. more nutritious crops, that driving yeah. the... Um, That's the hope. Yeah, so what if potentially we find that what produces the nutritious crops is higher cost and we're left with um, a situation where the crops or the produce is now more expensive and less available to people or, or just more limited to a to the people who are, have privilege exactly, wealth exactly, etc yeah um, certainly a potential concern the question was about you know what's the cost of production and if more expensive more nutritious crops are more expensive to produce than what happens to people who can't afford the best stuff. Um, yeah, that's what well, well said, yeah. Effectively, I've gotten this question yeah. a number of times. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> my experience as a farmer and a lot of the experience of other people in this space is that the more well you work with nature, as in the microbes on up, the lower your cost of production is. The greater the plant health, the greater the pest and disease resistance, the um, the greater the percent of yield potential that plant realizes, um, the lower your cost of fertilizer, the lower your cost of insecticides and fungicides, the lower your equipment costs. So while it's theoretically a possibility that this is the case, um, what all the data we have now seems to suggest is that the more we work in harmony with nature, not only does the cost of production go down, but the nutritional value goes up. So it's one of those magical little like nexus points where there's eight bottom lines that are positive. So and that would be we'll, we'll see. And that would be a way like if now if you're able to prove that um, you have a you know two apples and they're both the same price, one's got higher nutrition, then the, the engagement that we're doing with the community now is to see if the uh, the decision would be simple. You're going to choose the one that has higher nutrition and mm -hmm. growth the same. Because I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, a lot of people know that better, like higher nutritious crops are better for us, but we don't necessarily always make that choice. And what's the, what's the cutoff there? What's the disconnect in your... At this point, we have no way of knowing whether this bag of carrots is more nutritious than that bag of carrots or not. All we have are labels like local and organic. And in many cases, what we found so far is that local and organic do not correlate with better nutrition. So it's an education process, it's an um, investigation process, an engagement process, I guess. This, this might be a good one for you to answer as well. Like how do you see us shifting the perspective? Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is where Next7 is, is also playing a big role. Where Know, looking at the consumer, you know, there's, you've, you've identified Lisa, a this this a friend of yours as a, at your, if I can say your name, <laughs> you know a cat. Okay, let's call her Susan. As this this one particular. Okay, here's a here's a consumer who has a, a buyer who has a specific profile. Of, you know, mother or this or that, and you know how do we how do we shift the perception that nutrition is that valuing nutrition has the benefit that's worth any increase in price if there is one. So that's some of the work, that's some of the work that we're aiming to do is, is in education and, you know, in 
gathering, bringing people together, having people talk about this, just having it, nutrition be important. You know, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, since Jonas mentioned that profile, my friend, we had, the, we had a working session, and um, I was trying to, to communicate, you know, because I've been out there in the, um, you know, I guess in this world for, for a while. I've been um, eating and advocating for organic and small farmers and local farmers and local agriculture um, where I was raised in Iowa, and then more nationally through my other nonprofit organization. And I, I think, you know, there's, there's some idea out there, right, that people are kind of realizing that there's all these metric points, right? And so for me, it's about connecting the dots. So one of the metric points is that, oh, our soil doesn't have as many minerals in it, right? How many people are aware of that, right? Heard you've all, that. You've all kind of heard that, right? And so I'll be honest, I'll just say that for a long time, I was like, well, that's really a bummer, especially being grown up in Iowa. I was like, this is just, you know, this is a disaster, right? What are we going to do about this? And I kind of felt like there was only so much, and it depleted and depleted, and then we were just kind of screwed, you know? And then, and then I met Dan, and I was like, oh, wow, maybe we're not so screwed, right? Uh, maybe we can, you know, bring back that life and that vitality. And so for me, I mean, that's really... That's, that's one of the most hopeful stories. I mean, our story is a story of something really beyond hope because hope is kind of like a, you know, a sit back kind of thing, right? And so this is a place where we can engage in that, you know, what we call vital action, right? So it's, we're not just saying, oh, I hope this is going to be good. I think this could be good, but we're really engaging in it. That's why this citizen science piece I think is just so exciting, right? We're, we're reaching out to just kind of, I haven't really, I, I hate to put like any kind of label on anybody, but average people, people, um, when I say average people, I mean people in this campaign, people who are not agronomists, people who are not farmers, but people who, you know, care about the food that they eat for their body, people who care about the, you know, the growing bodies of their young children, right? Or if they're pregnant or, um, you know, they care about, um, you know, in Iowa, a lot of people care about the soil, right, and the topsoil that we're losing, and our clean water, and I, I think most everybody has some level of um, care about that. And so for me, this is the engagement piece. So I tell people, if you care about nutrition, if you care about children, if you care about environment, if you care about water, if you care about land, if you care about seed, um, if you care about climate, there is a place for you in this. This is vital action towards that end, right? Not even an end. It's hard to even find the language around it, right? But it's vital action towards restoration. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Jinx. Towards restoration and regeneration. Regeneration, that's a buzzword kind of now, especially in agriculture. But what's regeneration? Regeneration is life's way of continuing itself, right? It's a natural process. It's embedded in each one of us. It's embedded in seed. It's embedded in soil. It's embedded in all of life, all of nature. And all we have to do is like not interrupt it. We can engage it and facilitate it. And this is just a really easy way for all of us to do that because um, we have wonderful interaction with farmers and scientists and, and all of it. I'm super excited about this platform. <laughs> Rachel. I'm really excited about it too. Um, one question on the practical side of being engaged as a citizen science person. Do I need to buy a refractometer is my first question. No. No, not a <clears throat> spectrometer. No. Okay. I just send my vegetables. Uh, the, the process basically as it exists now is that you, you fill out an application form, which currently is on realfoodcampaign.org. And I admittedly is a little bit wonky for some. So Lisa gave a new URL, which is more simple. Um, we are planning to have that updated and more streamlined by the time that the spring happens. Um, but if you want to be engaging right now, what was the next7.org slash citizen science? Yes. Is one place where you can sort of give us your name and then you'll be reached out to. And realfoodcampaign.org is a place where you can go and fill out the, the whole survey. We pay for the samples. We pay for the shipping. Um, we pay for everything, you know, as far as those costs are concerned. 
I don't think we pay people to buy the crops themselves, do we? No. So it's on you to buy the carrots and the spinach. Um, but all the lab work and all the shipping is covered. You do not need to have a spectrometer. Um, we're basically getting the samples into the lab and doing all that data collection on the samples in the lab. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. My other question around engagement is that because I'm a little bit of an intellectual, I like to think about things in aggregate. And at the conference, the last time I attended, I saw a wonderful um, genetics and human genetics and um, nutrition study done on magnesium, which luckily earlier in the morning I took a soil sample test reading and talked about magnesium being done on the soil. So it was very connected. And the aggregate value of some of the genetic abnormalities that lead to disease in our society could be solved if we had this nutrient-dense food. So when I, when I care, I do care about water and food and my family's food, but I'm not the um, self-interested consumer. I'm like the societal change consumer, and I want to be able to turn other people on to that, too. So I'm kind of, I'm interested in doing this at this level, and I'm interested in this other level. And I'll just say there's going to be a panel discussion, I think, in this room tomorrow afternoon. Um, Kathleen uh, DiChiara and Jordan Schmidt talking about that exact topic of mineral deficiencies, chronic illness, nutrient levels in food, you know, systemic, systemic reversal of chronic illness through food that has greater nutrition in it. So, yeah, it's a very important visceral topic, I think, for people. And one back there, too, but yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, practically, I'm, I'm buying some good stuff at a farmer's market, but if I wanted to persuade the farmer to give me a soil sample, is there, like, a handout I could download and give, print out and give to them, and so they know what it's about? Um, there is. That's okay. <laughs> I think the best thing to do right now is get on our list, and we're in the process, we're in the process of working with the, the Real Food Campaign team and integrating, so we're going to have all that yeah. shortly. That might be a good opportunity. Right now, we have, um, I'm just, I'm feeling like there's so many people here that have been key, too, that we've asked to come. Um, and one person over here is Faith Reeves. She's been a really amazing data gatherer in Iowa, Fairfield, Iowa, and I would love for her to have an opportunity. We have time here for her to share some of her experience. She's been doing it for over a year, two years, yeah. And then up there, Dan Tarabist. Raise your hand, Dan. <laughs> um, Dan is um, a part of the Real Food Campaign Lab. He runs it alongside Greg, who's sitting right next to him. And right now, it's all really very personal. If you have questions, if you're like, oh, i got to send in these samples, but you know, I don't know, if, um, you know how I should send in my lettuce leaves or whatever. Um, you know, Lydia, when we kind of threw her into the field, she had some questions. And... We just put it right on the phone with uh, Dan. And, um, she got a lot of her questions answered. So right now, we, we are in that phase of like getting all that information um, for people together to make it a more simple and streamlined process, which is why we're really wanting to engage with you. Um, this is just kind of our soft launch of the citizen campaign piece out to the broader public. So um, your thoughts are like really helpful for us, your questions and, and all of that. Did, did you want to say something, Faith? Yeah. I just found, you know, coming, being a small farmer, um, talking to other farmers at farmers markets, I traveled around the region, um, just showing my enthusiasm for the beautiful produce that they had. Um, in most cases, um, I was able to get the produce just donated. You know, if you're coming from a... a you know, a heart space on it. Um, usually you can just get it donated, but I definitely recommend being ready and willing and honoring the hard work that they've put in. Um, but also last year, there was an opportunity where we were able to um, forward those results to the farmer, and so they were able to see those results. Is that an option this year? And so that's extremely valuable for those farmers. And um, that's another in, is to basically say, you know, hey, this is what we're doing, you know, get the, get the information, the update information from the Real Food Campaign, so you'll have a little handout. Um, you introduce yourself, you know, try not to hit them at the busy time, for sure, you know, um, go early or go late, you know, try, just watch your markets, and then um, 
you know, I would just basically um, introduce myself and ask if I could go to their farm. Um, and it was okay. You know, I was able to um, meet the farmers at their farm gate, say, I'm going to take, you know, six samples here today, and I'm going to take six soil samples along with those produce samples, and when this information is ready, I'm going to send you a link where you can view your data. Um, and so having the data in a digestible form for um, lay farmers who aren't necessarily able to read that CSV, um, or, but you did. You ended up having a really digestible format that was like, here are your, and I love the, I love the um, percentile adage this year. And so um, that really helped. And then, um, yeah, with the grocery stores, um, just going in and meeting the produce manager telling them who you are, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and really expressing that love and desire um, of nutrient-dense food and local. And, you know, just say, I'm here to, I'm here to just check out what's, what's, um, what's happening in the carrot world. And so I just need uh, two of these, two of these, two of these, <laughs> two of these. Um, and, you know, it's just making friends. You know, making friends, coming from a really um, grounded space, from a heart space, making friends and just saying we're just trying to increase the quality of the food supply and thank you for being a part of it. Helps. That being said, Brigitte's request for a two-page or, you know, write-up for the farmers I think probably is a really good suggestion that we don't have. Yeah. Um, and so one thing I'd love to be getting out of the event here in the next 40 minutes is what are some other things that you think you would like to have that would support you in actively engaging. So I'm not sure where all the, Greg, you've got one microphone. There's a lady back there in a red shirt who's been waiting for a long time. Yeah, if there's a bunch of people who haven't had a chance to say anything yet, I'm not sure if somebody wants to manage the, the crowd. I don't think your microphone's turned on. It's in the bottom. No. That's it. <laughs> you had mentioned that you were interested in looking at this on a more like societal level, which I think is really important. My question is, I can see where this technology is an easy sell for people that are already buying the carrots. Has there been any discussion about how to reach the people that aren't buying the carrots? Because I feel like those are the people that really, really need this because they're the most at risk for some of these degenerative diseases that come from the lack of nutritionally rich food. And I don't know if there's any way to even inco incorporate that. I mean, that's a pretty big reach, but I just didn't know if that discussion had happened at all in terms of this technology. You know, we're one small organization partnering with a couple other small organizations trying to sort of find the lowest hanging fruit, as it were, to work with. So there are other communities and organizations and networks that are addressing those things. I know that in the, the human health quote unquote world, the you know um, insurance companies and places like that, <clears throat> there's this thing called food is medicine, which I think Catherine Couch is going to be talking about tomorrow, I believe, um, is a big burgeoning space where the insurance companies are realizing that their costs go down really rapidly and quite significantly if people are more healthy. And it just coincidentally seems to be that when people eat fresh fruits and vegetables, they get more healthy. So there's all these protocols and processes in place where you know, your insurance premium decreases you know, $200 per month if you join a local CSA or whatever. Some, some companies will you know, buy a CSA share for every person in the, in the company. So there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on in that broader space. I'm not sure if John's going to be talking about uh, his ideas tomorrow um, with how we can... Kathleen's there too. Oh, Kathleen's... Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that tomorrow. And, yeah. and how to engage people potentially. Yeah. But on like a really small scale in your community, um, your, I have a loud voice, your, uh, your food banks, your food banks are probably open to accepting produce. And so, um, you know, just connect with your food bank and then connect with the farmers or the um, market growers or whoever and just make those connections where a little bit of, um, uh, you know, grow a row. There's a great grow a row program. And so getting the produce, um, you know, a little bit of extra donated produce into your food bank could go a very long way. 
And especially if you've already, you know, informed or enlightened that grower as to, you know, what is possible with nutrient-dense food production. Um, and then speaking to your institutions, speaking to your hospitals, speaking to your schools. Um, there are governmental programs that will support a percentage of the budget that is allotted. The USDA will allot a certain percentage of the budget um, uh, for local. And so if you're you know, it's like keeping that money in the community and so trying to talk to those farmers who then can collaborate with the institutions. And so it's just, you know, what are you willing to do? You know, or what, who can you encourage to, to pick up the baton? But, um, and then definitely go to John's talk tomorrow because he's going to, or if... Yeah. Can Because I think he should. Thanks. Can you hear me? Hey. So, um, maybe this belongs in a different session. I don't know. You can say it if it does, but my question is, you're collecting a lot of data, and it's obvious what the um, benefit is to the consumer, but it seems like um, there's an awful lot of data that we can learn as growers, you know, what are the best practices, and so could you speak a little bit about that and what you're learning and where you're at on that and yeah. what kind of data you're collecting? You want to talk about it? I got something to say, but Greg can go first. Um, those who were here first thing this morning may have heard uh, John Kempf announce um, a project uh, for an AI agronomist in collaboration with BFA and RFC. And, you know, foundationally, from my perspective, there's a couple basic things we're trying to accomplish here. One, to give consumers the ability to choose what food they purchase based on its inherent nutritional value. And two, to be able to support growers in making management decisions to improve inherent nutritional value. The last thing we want to do as an organization that's founded by farmers is to leave farmers feeling really up the creek when they bring their crops to drop them off and they're told by their buyer, sorry, it doesn't meet standard. So that is something we absolutely want to be avoiding. And so foundationally, we talked, you know, this year we have 100 farms doing this complete data, you know, collection about their historical dynamics and their in-season dynamics, that what the AI agronomist is designed to do is to support farmers who are willing to say, this is my soil type, this is my fertility program, this is, or this is, my, this is where I live, this is what I've done, this is what I want to grow, what's the best things I can do? And that's what we're actively designing for, is not only to give consumers the ability to choose based on quality, but to give farmers the ability to manage based on quality. And our thought is, if we can support both ends of that spectrum, then there's going to be this race to the top where, you know, presumably consumers start to say, you know, people like Faith are going to go to their farmer's market, to their, to their grocery store, and talk to the produce manager. And the produce managers will start hearing about it. And luckily, we've got, you know, we've been, I think we've been able to do a really good job of keeping this grassroots word of mouth buzz growing and building without coming out and making false claims. But as we start to get closer to the time when we're going to be able to do this, I think the buzz is building, and so there's going to be more pressure on farmers to say, you know, produce based on quality as opposed to produce based on volume, and we absolutely want to support that. How? Um, by working with as many farmers as possible to collect data about how they've managed, what's going on in the field this year, and how it correlates to nutrient levels. Once we can correlate management with nutrient levels, then we can support farmers and say, change this management practice and this management practice, and you're likely to increase nutrient levels. We can give direct agronomic recommendations in field, in season, to shift. John. I, I, I mentioned a couple of times, John Eicher, yeah. I'm an economist. And what I'm going to talk about tomorrow is kind of the future of food. But the point that's relevant to here, uh, markets have never fed poor people. Most people are hungry because they're poor. and relying on markets won't do that, and that's the reason we have government food assistance programs. And the problem is our government food assistance programs have become about as impersonal as the markets. So we've got more people that are food insecure now than we had back in the 1960s, in spite of the programs. So we need to think of different ways of getting good food to low-income people. In addition to that, now the food that they can afford to get is, is making them sick they're ending up buying junk food. So we're going to have to address that problem in a different way, and that's what I want to talk about tomorrow, is how we, how we deal with that and how it relates to getting good food, good nutritious food for everybody. And I think we could start with the 
low-income people where we have government programs where we could use those funds and use them better and then build on that. But I did have a question. You mentioned about um, organic food, not testing higher. Are you testing the research I've seen, and I'm certainly not an expert in this. I hope I get the names right. But the primary difference they found between organic and conventional food have to do with higher levels of antioxidants, flavonoids, uh, polyphenols. Are, are you testing that would detect those kinds of differences? We are testing both antioxidants and polyphenols. And those studies that have been out there have talked about averages. And this is actually a really important point that I like to make every time I talk about this because there's a big difference between the average and the variation. And so what, when the USDA goes and you know, defines what's in a carrot, like there's a USDA, you know, this is what's in a carrot, quote unquote. And what the USDA does is they go around the country, they've got, I think it's 12 different zones, and they go and go to a couple different grocery stores in each zone geographically. They buy crops off the shelf, they send them to a lab, they assay them for a suite of different nutrient levels. Um, they take the top 10% of, of the variants, the highest nutrient levels, and throw them out. They take the bottom 10% and throw them out. And then they average what's left. And they say, this is what's in a carrot. Now, there's not an average human. There's not an average you know, pig. There's not an average cow. There's not an average cucumber. And so what we've done with our lab work starting last year was to say, we want to identify the variation. We don't want to see what the average is. We want to see what the range is. And so this was what I said earlier, a 400 to 1800% variation. That was nutrient levels like in carrots from four parts per million copper to 16 parts per million copper from, you know, in spinach from 10 parts per million iron to 180 parts per million iron. That was the variation. And so I think that's a, one of the central points we need to be looking at here is, is not just, and, and this is I think pertinent to the organic conversation because you've got Cal Organic, which may be growing 40,000 acres of, of organic carrots, which are the vast majority of the carrots that are in the grocery stores, but they're at the 15th percentile. And there's a bunch of them that are at the 80th percentile or the 90th percentile that are grown by local farmers doing a good job. And so on average, organic crops have more antioxidants and polyphenols, but we're not looking for the average. We're looking for the variation, and we're looking to support people in purchasing from the top of the variation so that we can increase that overall. That's, I mean, I'm not sure if I made that point sufficiently. Yeah. Is it? But is it going to be measured? Is what going to be measured? We are measuring antioxidants and polyphenols, and what we found last year was a 75,000 to 200,000 percent variation. It's not 4 to 1 or 18 to 1, it's 75 to 1 or 200 to 1 in antioxidants and polyphenols. So you're saying it makes a lot of difference. How you grow things, the mineral levels vary a little bit, or if 400% counts as a little bit, I think it actually counts as a lot bit. The secondary metabolites vary massively, and those are the compounds that we think correlate with really strong health-giving attributes, but that's Kathleen's department more than it is mine. He's been waiting for a long time for whoever's handing out microphones. Uh, my question... Is there any controls? Like, I would imagine your farm would kind of be a control, because you're kind of immersed in this. Are you getting readings that are just off the charts, off the subject? So the question is about, you know, a control versus a, you know, experiment. People know the concept, like, this is the, we do things normal, and this is the thing we're doing different. That sort of reductionist, mechanistic form of science is foundationally what we are unpositing. I, just for background, when I first started talking about doing this, and we were looking around, and we found Greg, and we found Dorn, and we found these partners to engage this process with, we were saying, how do we answer this question about variation? How do we answer this question about what causes variation? And we said, we think there's a connection between soil health and plant health and human health. How do we assess it? And I ended up at one point in time being down at the USDA headquarters and in ARS headquarters in Beltsville, Maryland. And I was talking to the national program leaders about this. And I said, 
you know, we think there's a connection between soil health and plant health and human health. And they said, stop right there. Just so we're clear, so do we. We think there's a direct connection between soil health and plant health and human health, but, and, it's too complicated, we'll never figure it out. This is the ARS, the Agriculture Research Service, the wing of the USDA, which is most sophisticated and capable at answering these deep questions. And the reason that they don't think it's possible to be answered, these questions, is because they assume this model of a test, a plot, and a control plot. And life as a biological system is a, is a multi-factor system. It has many, 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 many different variables different mineral levels, different biological communities, different aeration and hydration and soil types. You, there is no average soil. You cannot just change one thing and say, okay, this is applicable everywhere. So I, that model of, of science, that, that randomized replicated trial model of science is not one that we can properly understand life with. And the way we're looking at this process is a biological form of science. I use the metaphor of epidemiology to explain this point. I say when there's a cholera epidemic in Haiti, they don't take people and experiment with them and say, okay, we're going to put this, you in this condition and you in this condition and wait, we're going to replicate that. So we're going to put these three people in this condition and these three people in this condition and we'll wait and see if any of them got cholera. That's not the way they, they figure out what caused the epidemic. What happens is when somebody comes into the clinic and says, I've got cholera, they say, okay, where were you yesterday? Where were you the day before that? Where did you sleep? What did you eat? You know, who did you talk to? Where did you drink water? They ask them dozens of questions. And when you get 60 people that come into the clinic all with cholera and they all got asked those same questions, there comes a point where there's an overlap. And all 60 people drank water from one of three wells. And they say, there's the overlap. There's the correlation. Let's go put a board over that well and tell people to stop drinking from it. And the epidemic stops. So the way we're looking at doing the scientific process is saying, let's get samples of crops in from as many different places as possible, from as many different backgrounds as possible, with as many different environmental conditions as possible, run it all through the lab, and look for patterns. So, um, I guess that's what I was asking. You yeah. provide the optimal, you, you remineralize, you uh, support your biological mm -hmm. communities. Yeah. Are you, are you seeing, like, with farm, with testing all this now, the dramatic difference, and it's, it's amongst the groups of farms? So this is the first, I mean, I would say, based on the data we had last year, that a number of the samples we got that were at the top 10th percentile were from farms we knew. Not all of them. A couple of them were from grocery stores. But a lot of the farms that I knew that I've been working with were like, oh, well, there they are. And they're, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> well, you never know what the management practices are because last year we didn't do that. Last year we just took the crops and ran them through the lab. This year we started with the looking at the data about management, and we haven't digested that yet. At the end of this growing season, we'll actually be able to say, look, these are the correlations or not correlations between management. So this is a process that we're building on over time, which takes money and takes people and yeah, this is where you guys come in. It's a big project. Um, no one's done it yet because it's so complicated. So um, with regards to your farm partners and your citizen scientists, are they looking at the same six crops or are they looking at different crops? This year, they're only looking at those six crops. So both, both. Yep. And we have not determined yet how many crops we'll be looking at next year because we don't know how much money we're gonna have. Fair enough. And then just a suggestion, well, the gentleman who asked a question before uh, with regards to um, the information and how it goes, have you thought about starting a like a contributors group or a users group where even at a show like this you, you have an hour and a half set aside for the people that are actually contributing to this so they get to the, get actual feedback of what's going on and get a picture or a sense of the big picture of how everything's going? That, that happened at 9 o'clock this morning. I missed it. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, is there any, uh, of the crops that you've chosen, is there any, like, method to that? Or you're just like, these are the, like, we're just going to start with carrots. These are just, like, foundational crops. We that... wanted to find crops of a different type. So roots, leaves, fruit. We'd like to do grain. We'd like to do meat. We'd like to do dairy. Every new crop you add, you have to 
develop a protocol for assessing it, and you have to make sure the logistics of shipping it through the mail and everything else works. The sensor on the tool we have now is a certain size, so we're choosing crops that will fit on the sensor we've got right now. So there's a, a few different metrics. They haven't been, what Lisa's been suggesting, crops that are more you know, niche or have a cachet that people will get more, you know, care more about, like milk, for instance. Seems like a lot of people who care for their children make sure that the dairy they buy is of high quality. And so if we could go out there and say, look, you know, Stonyfield or Organic Valley or whatever has really poor quality milk, that might get us a big buzz. And we haven't been activating in that kind of a way yet. Maybe going forward we will. I just want to, we have about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the microphone is for the recording, not for us. So if you guys have any questions. I just wanted to further comment. Uh, tomorrow morning at 9, when we talk about nutrient density and why it matters, will be before John's talk, uh, is really to address some of the questions that have come up about you know, people that, like what you were talking about, it, for the people that are already eating carrots, we know that most people are actually not eating um, enough healthy whole foods, fruits, and vegetables. So there's that human behavior that's actually um, the first problem. And then secondly, there's the the problem that we want to get to the people that aren't actually just eating a good diet in general and how do we get this information to them in terms of if we're going to convince them that increasing food quality matters, why would it matter to them if they're already not even cooking their own food and consuming their own food? So we do need to address those issues because none of this matters if people don't see a value in improving food quality. And so really addressing that and consumer information uh, is really critical. It's very critical to get the movement of people behind this initiative. And one way to do that is to make a correlation to why it matters in their life. And what Dan is talking about is really disease patterns. So we see the same patterns uh, that he's talking about in the food system is actually having in diseases. So disease pathology also has patterns. And it correlates with mineral deficiencies. And so we're going to try to make that argument that we don't not only want to reverse disease pathology, but we also want to prevent it. And so if we can help the consumers understand that food quality is going to solve a much bigger problem for them, uh, then the, in the incentive for them to really participate in that is actually going to be increased. So it, if people want to really engage in that conversation tomorrow, we're going to have a panel discussion, but we want to really talk about it. What do you see are the barriers? We want this to be a problem for everybody, uh, a solution for everybody, I should say. So we want to talk about what are the barriers that people are seeing in their communities, and then we can talk about those solutions so that I can then help Lisa with Next7 communicate that out through their marketing. So it's really important that this is all connected, uh, that the problems and the solutions and the communication is all synced up. So we can do that tomorrow morning. If people want to talk about it, I'm very solution-based, and so I'm happy to come up with a solution to the problem. Anybody doesn't know Kathleen, she's an absolute spitfire and well worth <laughs> attending her workshop. But this, this broader point, I think, bears repeating, and that is there's a really nice correlation, and she's got the data between mineral deficiencies in your, in your food, mineral deficiencies in your body, and disease states in your body or in your children's body. And our thought is that that's a, the more, one of the most visceral drivers or incentives out there for causing people to shift their actions is disease, is, is very poor health. I would argue that part of the reason why people don't eat their fruits and vegetables is because they don't taste good. And the reason they don't taste good is because they're not nutritious. Because we're animals and we're <coughs> wired with the ability to see, to test whether something's good for us or not with our tongue. And children are animals. And when you feed them a carrot that tastes bitter, they spit it out because it's not particularly good for them. It may be better than a, you know, a Snickers bar, um, but the Snickers bar knows that they're animals and has balanced the salt, sugar, and fat levels so that their animal senses are tricked. My experience is that if you provide high quality carrots to children or teenagers, they will eat them without thinking about it because they taste good and they're animals. And so this is one of those things is when, you know, if you can identify the variation in nutrient levels, you can say people don't eat many carrots, but they eat some carrots. They should be eating five times more carrots than they're eating right now to get their nutrient levels met. Well, how about if they could find the carrot that was five times more nutritious than the average, they would only have to eat the number of carrots that they're eating right now to get the nutritional needs met. 
and they might actually eat more of them because they taste good, and then they'd be able to systemically begin to address those nutritional deficiencies. So from a foundational standpoint, I think we have the pieces of the puzzle of a systemic solution. But, you know, as you can tell from this presentation, we're still a good ways out. In 15 minutes that are, re that are remaining, Brigitte had a question about, can you give us a, a handout that we can bring to farmers that would explain to them what we're doing? Are, what are other things that people here who are considering being engaged feel like they would need for support? Yeah, just basically, you know, what you're explaining right now and, and you know, summarized in, in some form that yeah. people can digest quickly and just kind of what you're trying to do and, and where your website is and, you know, how people can find more information if they're interested. And you just had, like, little leaflets that we could print off. I'd totally print them off and give them out at the farmer's market and give them out of the food pantry. Awesome. I would just add to that well-produced video online that they can go to afterwards as the follow-up where you have, like, the information at the farmer's market that's that first impression and then on their own time can go back and go into more depth. Yeah. Um, I just had a question about um, what your criteria is going to be for the light system with the green and the yellow and the red, like what's the grading, you know, and, and how you came to that thought that that should be, that way that should be for that. Um, the process of defining what is good, what is bad, is by definition an open process. So um, I'm not sure when we'll have the final data from the lab, probably at the end of the year or so. Um, so here's the numbers, here's the, then here's the patterns, here's the statistics, here's our best guess, what do you think? Who has comments, who has critiques? This is going to be, the, the vision is this is an open iterative, collaborative process, and all thoughtful people are welcome to engage in it. And if you can get the nutritionists and the microbiologists and the biochemists and everybody else to engage actively with the data and come up with their thoughts, then we have, you know, crowdsourced this definition. And that's our hope, is that it is open, collaborative, iterative, and evolving over time. It's not a fixed standard like organic or whatever. It's an evolving standard as we understand more. So there's another point to this that's the benefit to the person helping source the data and introduce the farmers and their food to, your, to the program. And that's that they're also going to be seeing, like if they're a mom or a, a single dad or something, that they're seeing, oh, this farmer tested out pretty good. I think I'm going to buy more food from them. So there may be groups of people that we can source through organizations that can send, like I'm thinking Moms Across America or Organic Consumer Association or, you know, some of them that are more pliable that we can get with. And is that something that would be helpful where you get lots Absolutely. of people doing this? That's just our thought is is, is, is there a way we can utilize all the amazing networks around the country and around the world who are effectively aligned yeah. to engage in a common objective? Yeah, and the point being that their membership would get benefit out of doing it, besides that they're helping, besides they want to see this happen already, they would know better food to buy for their families. Exactly. Cool. So anybody's got introductions, relationships, connections, suggestions, all that is what we're looking for. We're not going to pull this off, just the four of us here on the stage. I was wondering, too, if you had on, on the website or something like, what could a carrot be? That was kind of why I asked about your farm. Like, what is, what is the potential of the data? Like, how nutritious could a carrot be? And, like, what's the range we should be shooting for? And what are you seeing in the data? Just kind of summarize for people to digest that, you know. We put that out on our website in, in a newsletter earlier this year, the report from last year's data. And it was this 200 to 1. This, some, this carrot had as many polyphenols in it as 200 of those carrots. That's a big variation. Yeah, just having that easy to access on a website that, you know, yeah. I could give a pamphlet to somebody and they could see, like, oh, wow, that's oh my how it could be. And this <laughs> Which is what one was this? seeing in the grocery <laughs> store, you know. Uh, Dan, I had a question. Um, I'm working on a project right now. It's actually a research project that's we're studying soil health and nutrient quality, but it's we're using old, old school methods for the nutrient quality. But um, my question, yes, what, how you guys could help. We, we probably could use a little agronomic help. How do you feel about actually taking the opportunity to 
to get some better agronomic practices to, to actually improve the quality. And we're, we're adding a lot of biology, and I'm tracking the biology with microscopes and stuff like that, and I'm taking all kind of data. But could I get, could I ask for help from the BFA to, for, for some agronomic help to improve maybe how we're doing nutrients and stuff? Uh, that's a separate wing of the organization, as it were. But yes. <laughs> and if you wanted to see how good your crops are, you could become a farm data partner and send your crops into the lab. Yeah. Yeah, so in addition to a handout for farmers, um, I think like, your nutritionists and dietitians are obviously a good channel to get this information out because they educate the consumers. Yeah. And like, like myself, I teach um, workshop series and give talks everywhere. I could easily integrate this topic into, into many of them. And if I had something to just give to people, that's like to the point. Five minutes of, in a module for a, a presentation or 20 minutes of right. content or something like that. That right. could I be really that, powerful. Yeah, and just approaching all the other dietitians, nutritionists, um, networks that they are. Western Price, I can try to get it in there. Yeah. So for the um, getting the uh, volunteers to help out, um, we seem to have a good understanding of how to do that. Uh, one of the things I think we have to approach, though, is, is how to get the farmers engaged, because that seems to be an issue as well. So what is in it for the farmer? Right? Everyone's talking about how we can get excited about it, but that doesn't benefit them. So I, I think we have to start thinking about that, i.e., from what I hear, is they get free soil sample testing. And crop. And crop testing. So I, I think we have to push that a little bit as well, because I think the key thing is, is without the farmers, we're not going to get too much information. And if people have suggestions of farmers who they would like to be introducing us to, or they themselves are farmers, or organizations of farmers that might be interested, um, we did submit a grant proposal for, what was it, four and a half million dollars, I think, this the year that we will, we haven't received it yet, but it's possible, working with 250 different farmers through eight different organizations in six different states to you know, have a staff person that supports them in doing the data collection and sending the samples in and really working through the NOFAs and the PASAs and the OFAs and the, the VABFs and all those different organizations around the country uh, to support their farmers in figuring these things out, et cetera. So yeah, certainly people feel like they've got connections to farmers or farmers organizations. They're very welcome as well. So Dan, you know, I'm all about the emerging adult, the undergraduate education. You've spoken at my college. Um, <clears throat> just let's remember them and engage them as this process goes forward. I can see a tasting panel on every campus where you know, uh, you know what the mineral count is. You know what, you know, who's at the low bar and who's at the high bar and what the data is. And let the college students decide what tastes best. You know, let them use all their senses. I mean, I remember one of your early conferences, we had a beet tasting. I mean, it was fabulous. I, like, didn't know I loved this particular kind of beet. And then every time I went to a farmer's market, I looked for it. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the hands-on, you know, making it real, and then, and then connecting with faculty to embed some of this data-driven, you know, into the curriculum um, in the sciences. Um, so you, you know about you know, some, some about my vision, as, as does Hunter, and I really, I, I want to be that person for you to go to when you're ready. If to you want to help make some curriculum, yes, then yes. we can share that across the network to other people who want to do that same thing. That would be great. Yeah. Yep. So. And not just for college, but for elementary schools and... Um, right. Well, yeah. I'm, my focus is going to be the emerging adult and college Fine. campuses at the undergraduate level, and I'll let <clears throat> those who are working in the undergrad, you know, in the high schools and the grade schools do that, but uh, that's a certain population, and right. they're ready to launch, you know, so we might as well inform them as to, because that opens up a whole new narrative for them. What, what is this restorative food and farming? Movement? I'll tell you, I had an experience recently in speaking to a number of undergrads at a, actually in a nutrition department at, um, I think it was Michigan State or University of Michigan, the one that, State. Michigan State, talking all about this stuff, 500, you know, kids in a undergrad, you know, big theater style, um, two, two 500 room <laughs> classes, and I kept trying to get them excited about nutrition, and they just really couldn't, 
get off their smartphones. But when I started talking about the connection between plant health and soil health and carbon sequestration and reversing climate change, all of a sudden, all the smartphones got put right down. Um, it was really interesting seeing that it seemed like the existential dread of the world is doomed, I have no future, you know, I can't have children, I'm just, we're going to be in this cataclysm, has deeply set into their psyches. And, you know, just the idea that there was a possibility of a theory of a, you know, a way out, really it struck me that it was that piece that got them, not all the psych meds they're on and everything else that they're struggling with, you know, and the plausibility of infertility, you know, being epidemic in their generation and all this kind of stuff, which is, I would think, pretty serious. They're like, we don't have a chance anyways. Yeah, exactly. So, interesting, but I've been totally dominating the front of this room, as everyone's obviously clear. You I just want wanted to anything? speak to the data that we get back as farmers. Um, it's, the soil data is not like your standard soil test. It's not like a Malik 3. It's more of a deep digest on your soil. And so it's not something that you can um, have an agronomist make a recommendation off of for amending your soil. Um, it's really valuable, uh, you know, as that just it's super duper deep digest baseline. Um, but um, the comparison, just to see, it's your report card, just to see where you're at when you're seeing those polyphenols, those antioxidants, the mineral levels that come back in your, the soil and the plants are being tested with the same, the same type of testing um, method. And so you can, you know, it is valuable, but it's not something that correlates directly to a standard soil test. And so I wouldn't bill it like that to your farmer. Um, just more of this is, this is a great way to see where you're at in comparison to other growers. And I also just want to speak from personal experience. On my farm, you know, it's a demonstration farm. It's a perennial polyculture, very diverse, um, uber small, but really just, um, you know, I, I, I've gone haywire. There's so many different amendment um, practices, controls and treats and planting um, uh, schemas. And so um, the difference between the same variety of carrot planted through these different um, treatments, huge variation. And then variety to variety, huge variations. And so this um, information that we're collecting right now, we're going to see um, which varieties are more prone to being able to produce those um, high levels of secondary plant metabolites. You know, do we just need to leave the Danver in the dust and go for these carrots, you know, or, you know, so um, there's a lot of valuable knowledge that the growers are getting, um, but it may not be like, you know, give this to your agronomist and make a soil recommendation. Um. Uh, I wanted to make two things. One, like we're super, super interested in partnering with anybody who has experiments that they want to run. So that's like fantastic. Basically, you should definitely get a hold of us. And if you want to run experiments with undergrads and taste, that's awesome. This year, um, we ran um, an experiment comparing garden plots in Boulder with different kale varieties. Actually, it was the same kale variety, but different. Um, applications. They had a couple of different applications. So we did run one. We run it one more, but the, the more we hear about and the more we know about, we will totally engage that. So is anybody in the room interested in that? Please, please let us know. Super interested. Um, and um, second, I think the place in which we're weakest as a, as a lab and a process is connecting to the human health part. We haven't even really attempted to do that. And that's like, a, from our perspective, like scary and complicated. Um, so if it's not scary and complicated to you, then you should come, you should come talk to us um, because we don't know what we're doing on that side of things. So, um, and also if you have expertise in um, nutrition itself, so which compounds we should be looking at, um, you know, given that we can only measure a very a small subset of things at this point, what things should we be looking for? And then maybe if we can then go look for methods which are, um, you know, which are financially feasible to run to get that, you know, that kind of work. Um, we would love to integrate that. So, um, yeah, just, I think now we tried to do this early on where we had working groups actually around um, the nutrition component and around the testing component to really try to build our 
knowledge base since we're not the experts. I think now that we're into year two or year three, we have enough kind of cred where maybe we can rethink that because we really do need that information. And we do have multiple labs now with a lot of interesting folks and other expertise in it too. So um, the effort that you would maybe put into giving us some advice and thoughts um, would go a lot, a lot beyond just, you know, me and Dan and the team in Michigan. So um, yeah, please, please let us know. Any final questions, comments? Um, I'll just say one last thing, and you know, it's always one of those somewhat uncomfortable topics, but um, I, I think I brought it up obliquely before. Uh, this is an open source, charitably funded endeavor for the greater good, and um, our capacity to implement is directly connected to the amount of cash on hand we have. So we'll be making a little presentation about this broader work this evening um, after dinner and making an ask, but if anyone here you know, is willing to or interested in putting in $5 a month, $20 a month, $50 a month as an ongoing you know, support uh, or willing to reach out to some of their friends to do so or know someone who's got you know, the ability to write $1,000 checks or $100,000 checks, all that we're certainly interested in and that is a piece of this puzzle. Um, we have the, the deeper work we're trying to accomplish and it is oftentimes overshadowed by keeping it funded. So that's always part of the equation. But hope everyone's had a good time. <laughs> I think we're, we're at our hour and a half time window. So thank you very much. <clears throat>